afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third annual Victor J. Zhao Distinguished Lecture in Global Health. I'm Chris Plow. I'm the director of the Duke Global Health Institute, also known as DGHI, and I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon for what I know will be a very enlightening and timely discussion. Uh, DGHI launched this lecture uh, three years ago with support uh, of Victor Zhao, the Chancellor Emeritus uh, of Health Affairs here at Duke and now President of the National Academy of Medicine. Among his many contributions to Duke, Victor was one of the key people who helped conceive and create DGHI, and he's been a true champion of Duke's interdisciplinary approach to global health. It's, it's been our goal to make this lecture series a forum for all the people uh, from all the schools and departments across Duke University and Duke Health who care about global health to come together and explore some of the most important issues facing our field. Uh, and so before I introduce our speaker, I just want to thank Victor and Ruth Zhao, who, who was unfortunately not able to be here at the last minute, uh, to thank them for helping us create this opportunity. So thanks, Victor. Thank and now uh, let me say a few words about our topic and about our speaker. Uh, we aspire for this lecture to spotlight the most urgent issues and to feature the most compelling thinkers in global health. And in today's talk, we've got both of these covered in spades. We've, got, we've picked an urgent issue, and we've managed to land a very compelling thinker. The issue is universal health coverage, or UHC, which is one of the most talked about topics in global health, and, and with good reason. The global embrace of UHC is based on the argument that healthcare is a fundamental right of all people. It also reflects the growing understanding that providing universal health coverage is a path to economic prosperity of all countries. But achieving UHC is not going to be easy, and it's not going to be simple, and it's especially challenging in low- and middle-income countries. Our speaker today is uniquely positioned to help us think about these challenges. Dr. Tim Evans has been a leader in studying and strengthening global health systems for more than two decades. Uh, and he's been one of the earliest and strongest advocates for putting universal health coverage on the global health agenda. Tim recently completed a six-year tenure at the World Bank, where he served as the Senior Director of the Health, Nutrition, and Population Global Practice. In that role, he helped direct the World Bank's financing priorities to ensure the strength of preventive and public health systems in countries around the world. Before that, uh, Tim was Assistant Director General at the World Health Organization, where he led the Commission on Social Determinants of Health and oversaw the production of the annual World Health Report. He was also a co-founder of the Global Alliance on Vaccines and Immunization, or GAVI, a public-private partnership that has become hugely influential in helping low- and middle-income countries protect their people, especially infants and children, from vaccine-preventable infectious diseases. Uh, DGHI Director Shenglin Tong worked with Dr. Evans at WHO and Shenglin vividly recalls Tim's visionary leadership in promoting uh, UHC as a cross-cutting global health priority. Uh, in 2010, Tim organized the first global symposium on health policy research, where UHC was formally proposed for the first time. He and uh, Shenglin, along with others at WHO, then formed Health Systems Global, an international society that continues to bring together policymakers and researchers to push for universal coverage and care. Throughout his career, which also includes global health leadership roles with the Rockefeller Foundation, the Harvard School of Public Health, and Brack University in Bangladesh, Dr. Evans has developed innovative strategies to advance global health equity and improve access to care. This includes efforts to increase access to treatment for mothers living with HIV and innovative approaches to training community-based midwives in Bangladesh. Tim recently became the inaugural director of the newly created School of Population and Global Health at McGill University in Montreal, where he is also Associate Vice Principal for Global Policy and Innovation. Uh, we've had some great conversations with Tim uh, among some of our faculty and staff and, uh, and students today, and we're already cooking up some great ideas for collaboration uh, with Tim and his, uh, and his community up in Montreal. So we're, we're very fortunate uh, to have gotten someone with this great combination of talents and experience. Uh, to share his perspectives on UHC, and please uh, join me in welcoming Tim Evans. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, and thank you to uh, the Duke community for, uh, for having me uh, uh, provide this uh, uh, lecture. 
Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a great honor to do anything uh, in the name of Victor and Ruth Kuperzow. Um, they're, uh, they're giants for, for everybody and, and all of us. So um, I'm going to uh, try and make sure that the next 45 minutes is the part of the day that you can shut your eyes and, and go to sleep. I'll ring a bell and uh, that means you can wake up and hopefully you'll be refreshed. Um, the topic is a little bit uh, uh, jarring, uh, but uh, uh, I've chosen it because uh, I've recently returned to academia and I'm trying to figure out what I need to do. And uh, I have a strong belief that universities need to be leaders, uh, but I'm not sure we're there at the moment. Uh, so uh, I chose this topic very much as a personal agenda. And what I'm going to suggest, uh, what I'm going to present in the next few minutes is much more um, uh, raising questions than uh, uh, providing any blueprint. Uh, but I will chat a little bit about uh, how well we're doing on UHC, uh, talk about two examples, uh, um, Kenya and then uh, in Canada, and then look at uh, universities in UHC loss along our two sort of primary constructs, which is knowledge generation and translation, and then the second round know-how. Um, that's the people that you need to uh, be the actors and the leaders in every health system. And I'll finish by just pointing to some uh, role models. So I'll start uh, with my father, um, who uh, uh, was a pioneer in uh, problem-based uh, medicine uh, 50 years ago. And I, and I put this slide up in part because he passed away five years ago today. But um, more importantly for me, um, uh, he created a medical school to which I gained access. Um, there may have been a slight conflict of interest there, so I'm grateful for him promoting my career. Uh, but uh, when I did my residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in uh, Boston um, uh, in the 1990s, um, uh, Harvard had just um, uh, announced the new pathway. And the new pathway was problem-based learning. And essentially, it was the McMaster model um, uh, 20 years later. And uh, one of the great giants of epidemiology, uh, David Sackett, uh, was at an American uh, uh, Colleges of Medical Education meeting. And uh, he, in the early 1990s, said, what Harvard calls the new pathway, uh, we at McMaster call the old pathway. Uh, so. Uh, a little bit of uh, UHC, it is about realizing uh, the right to health, as uh, uh, Chris uh, identified, and it has three primary axes, a set of benefits, which are health services according to need, um, protection from burdens to make sure that financially uh, you are not worse off because of accessing care, and then an overwhelming focus on priority being given to the worse off, uh, the worst off or uh, the equity focus. So um, when we look at reports, uh, whether uh, 2017 or 2019, the fact is we've got a long way to go. Uh, glass half full, glass half empty, 50% of people lack uh, access to basic health services globally. And on the protection side, about 100 million people are impoverished every year due to paying for health services. And this is probably one of the largest drivers of extreme poverty in the world. Uh, and again, we're trying to eliminate extreme poverty as part of the SDGs, so you understand how important this agenda is with respect to achieving the SDG objective of eliminating extreme poverty. Now, uh, the Lancet um, is always very good at reminding us of our responsibilities, as particularly its editor, uh, who's, uh, who's a dear colleague and friend, uh, but uh, this provocative faceplate on the Lancet, academic medicine must take more responsibility for global health. And that was in 2010, or I think 2009, 2010, that it came out. Um, and that really then raised the issue. Are we stepping up? Uh, are we the laggards or are we leaders um, when it comes to uh, universal health coverage? Let me begin with a case study in Canada. 1962, uh, this fellow was the premier of a prairie province called Saskatchewan in the middle of Canada, uh, Tommy Douglas, and he felt it was unjust 
for farmers to have to sell their farm in order to pay for medical care. And so he introduced in 1962 the Saskatchewan Medicare Act. And the physicians, the Saskatchewan Medical Association, promptly went on strike. Uh, and um, this created a little bit of calamity, but uh, they came back when there was an agreement that payment in this system would be fee for service. And when they did come back, uh, there was a domino effect across the other provinces and territories in Canada, such that by 1965, 66, every province in Canada in our federal system had um, a single payer provincial system. So we went to UHC. Now, I'm at McGill, and when I arrived there, I thought I should learn something about my institution. Uh, this fellow, who was ahead of his time when it came to the environment, um, a bike rider, not a car driver, Corbett McDonald was the first chair of the Department of Epidemiology uh, at uh, McGill. And he got a grant from the National Institutes of Health to study the effects of Quebec Medicare on physician consultation for selected symptoms. Now, this was a function of the NIH being really concerned with what was happening north of the border. They said, oh my god, is this infectious? Is this coming in our direction? So they funded uh, Corbett, and he found, in fact, that there was actually a progressive effect of Medicare. Those people, um, uh, uh, lower income families, had more doctor consultations um, uh, following the introduction of Medicare uh, than before. However, fast forward to almost 60 years, and a recent uh, uh, headline in our national newspaper, the Globe and Mail, half of Canadians have too few local psychiatrists or none at all. A massive mental health gap across the country. And you ask yourselves, well, after 60 years of universal health coverage, why can't we get that right? And I'm reminded of what Shekhar Saxena says when it comes to mental health, all countries are developing. The case in Kenya, uh, and uh, one of the greatest, uh, in my mind, most inspiring academic leadership partnerships that I've been associated with, which is called AMPATH, the Academic Model Providing Access to Healthcare. And I know some of the people in the room have some association with that. Um, they have been amazingly effective at taking uh, the opportunity of making sure um, everybody in Western Kenya gets access not only to uh, HIV treatment, antiretroviral therapy, but good prevention, and then good community-based care. And this is a picture of one of the community health workers with a, uh, a palm-held digital device who's relaying results from uh, the recent lab tests that individual had in that individual's home in the village. And it gives you a sense of how they've been so successful in pioneering new models of care. However, Kenya is now a middle-income country. And it devolved its health sector to 47 counties. And they are moving towards universal health coverage. And PEPFAR has decided to cut back on funding to Kenya. And so AMPATH is saying, how are we going to finance ourselves? And while this partnership has tremendous depth in so many areas, it is incredibly shallow when it comes to thinking about how to navigate and negotiate financing in the national context of Kenya. So it's not well prepared for this transition, which um, if you had thought about it looking forward now, um, and, and, uh, that obviously one day we would move uh, to a situation where uh, not only uh, HIV, but everything in the Kenyan system would be nationally financed. So I'm going to move now to talk about knowledge for UHC um, and uh, a few dimensions of that. Uh, as was mentioned by Chris, um, uh, we were concerned um, at WHO when I worked there that if you look at the distribution of resources for research and health, 
uh, there's a huge skew. Biomedical research consumes the vast majority. Clinical evidence research has grown up very significantly in the last 50 years to have a respectable financing. But systems research is dismally underfunded and not a science that is often respected. In fact, a lot of people take the Nike view of systems, which is you just do it, right? Uh, whereas those who are involved in complex systems realize that it does require knowledge. So this was a deliberate effort using the stewardship um, vehicle of WHO to create a global um, community that would really develop and sharpen uh, health systems research around the objective of universal health coverage. And so that started uh, 10 years ago. Now, we're looking for impact of this and as selective evidence. I looked at the number of UHC publications that you can find. And if you look around 2010, you see a very significant uptick, right? But look at the y-axis at the number of publications. Okay, in 2020 or 2019, almost 1,800 publications. So we put it in perspective and compare it to publications on HIV. And you see that there are 10 times as many publications on HIV. And if you look at the uptick in publications from 2010 to 2020, I'm not so sure our symposium is really responsible for the uptick in the publications on UHC. Okay, so that's a sobering fact. If you look and then survey the landscape on institutional knowledge leadership around UHC, it's nascent, to use a euphemistic term. Um, when I was at the Brack School of Public Health, we created a center of excellence for health systems and universal health coverage. I'm not sure there are any other NGOs in the world that have such a center of excellence. Uh, it's still operating 10 years later and has, has done some good things. The Institute, uh, uh, National Institute of Public Health in Mexico was incredibly helpful in uh, the design of the reforms led by Minister Frank uh, when he was uh, the Minister of Health in terms of the design, implementation, evaluation of the Opportunidades and the uh, Progressa reforms uh, for universal health coverage. And then on the bottom here, you have KPMG. That's a consulting company. And they've been sniffing, I think, uh, business opportunities and not having much competition from the academic world are saying, hey, uh, we can offer advice uh, on this. And um, so they've entered. Uh, but it isn't like you've got great depth uh, in institutionally on the knowledge front. There's a joint learning network that we created in 2008, and this brings country practitioners together to identify common questions and opportunities. It's now 24 countries strong, and those are very um, uh, lively areas where tacit knowledge and experience is exchanged amongst those doing implementation. Uh, but it's more on that front than it is the formal uh, academic uh, 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 research. If you look at how we're doing in assessing change, um, in Bangladesh, a Lancet series looked at the move towards universal health coverage and services and showed that, in fact, there's some great progress, uh, much greater equity in immunization coverage uh, according to asset quintile over time, and some evidence that there, it is possible to break what Tudor Hart described in The Lancet as the inverse care law. And so I say to all of my students, if there's one law you want to break, it's the inverse care law. In addition, um, the whole NCD epidemic is uh, really um, uh, shedding light on systems, especially as we transition from MD MDGs to the ST uh, SDGs. Uh, in Chile here, you can see on the top pretty good coverage, uh, effective coverage, uh, for virtually all of the uh, MDG interventions. But when you look at effective coverage of NCDs, 
you can see um, they're lagging behind. And attention has been brought by many of the academic uh, leaders in the community to quality through the Lancet Commission on Quality and Global Health. So those are, I think, uh, evidence of, of the academic community moving in the right way. This is uh, the village uh, in southeastern Guinea, uh, Department of Gekidu, where the sentinel case of Ebola was in 2013. This was a village that had no access, no contact with any health system. And we saw what happened there. It took three months before you had the identification of the epidemic, at, one point, at, what, at, at, which, at which point it was already endemic or had spread to three countries and, and was, had become pandemic. And this is from Wuhan, uh, the current context of the novel coronavirus. And when you look at where the academic leadership is in preparing for uncertainty, it's hard to point to places where you've got the scholarship uh, that is understanding efficient modes of surveillance, uh, the supply chains related to infection prevention and control, and other things that are absolutely essential in managing these crises effectively. Things are changing and changing rapidly. On the left here is a drone that uh, uh, drops uh, uh, life-saving blood products uh, outside, three feet outside uh, uh, surgical um, uh, suites in Rwanda uh, and uh, can get those blood products anywhere in the country within an hour. Um, transform the supply chain entirely. Uh, academic health centers really didn't have much to do with that. And here on the right is a triage robot I encountered in China. Uh, it helps direct patients in a busy hospital. And uh, when I told it I had uh, chest pain radiating into my arm, I was short of breath and diaphoretic, those green eyes went all red. And a whole team of cardiac intensivists came out and wheeled me into the uh, cath lab. And they're about to you know, do everything. And I said, no, 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 I was only joking. Uh, <laughs> so anyways, this is the new age. And um, where's the leadership in academic health centers with respect to how this might transform opportunities for coverage uh, is absolutely important. Financing. Um, we need to really rethink how we finance health systems everywhere. Uh, we have the legacy of Otto van Bismarck, which is social health insurance, uh, which is for places where people get a paycheck every week and employers make contributions. It works. But in most low and middle income countries in the world, the numbers of people who work in the informal sector, i.e. they don't get a paycheck, is growing over time, not decreasing. So we're not going to have social health insurance be the single solution. Likewise, the beverage system, the tax-based um, National Health Service introduced uh, just after the war in the UK, um, if you look at rates of increase in tax collection in most low and middle income countries, very, very, very slow despite the best efforts of institutions that I used to work at, like the World Bank and the IMF, that increase is not going, that rate of increase is unlikely to make taxes the single or universal source for financing the system. And we really need to get beyond the default, which is what I call the Benjamins. I think is, that's a $100 bill in the United States, right? Because Benjamin Franklin is on them. So we, this is the most inefficient and inequitable form of financing and far too prevalent virtually everywhere. So when you think about paying out of pocket, uh, which is the most common form of uh, financing, pay when you're sick, um, the value of that is about $600 billion per year. It's a huge number. So if you, through innovative ways, could just harness 25% of that six billion, 600 billion, that would be $150 billion per year 
more for UHC. And that's five times total development assistance for health. Okay, so these proportions are important because when you think about an individual who goes and gets health care and pays out of pocket, you're not thinking about that big picture. But it adds up across systems to be a massive number and a resource that we cannot afford to squander in moving forward. So we really need to think about accelerating fintech for financing UHC, cashless health co uh, contributions, uh, volume to value patient uh, payments, and you know, data mining on claims. These are all some of the things that are moving and could be opportunities. But again, are academic health centers really on the edge of that agenda? I spoke with Gavin today, and I, I'm quite sure their policy group is on this uh, based on what I learned and heard. It's not only getting into the weeds on services and financing, it's also the big picture. And understanding systems reform more widely. And so the investing in health report that the World Bank did um, really transformed the way people saw um, opportunities for health globally. And in fact, um, it was featured in this great Netflix that's called Inside Bill's Brain. If you haven't seen it, it's three-part series, really worth seeing. But he goes and he picks out the World uh, Development Report from 1993. He said, this report made it clear to me why my legacy in terms of my philanthropy is well uh, directed towards ensuring every child has an equal opportunity for health globally. But it was complemented 20 years later by a Lancet effort called Global Health 2035. And you may recognize at least one of the people there uh, uh, on the right. Uh, he looked as if he had a few more curls, but not many. Um, and uh, Dean Jameson on the left, who was the author of the 1993 uh, report. Uh, but again, that report was giving a big picture of an opportunity to move to an unprecedented convergence uh, between uh, rich and poor countries in terms of outcomes and gave a lot of impetus to one saying why this was so important from a big economic perspective and values of statistical lies, but also uh, that this could be done uh, by thinking rationally about managing the health sector. UHC also, though, will go much faster if we understand and embrace the broader determinants of health and uh, uh, Chris, you mentioned the uh, Commission on Social Determinants of Health. Understanding how to action these other sectors is absolutely uh, imperative and will provide a huge boost. Again, we're seeing scholarship in this area, but the degree to which leadership is palpable in academic health centers uh, is still questionable. Now, you may say, well, what is the incentive for academic health centers to take this on? And so when we wrote the, the World Health Report on the 30th anniversary of primary health care, and in the areas of moving forward in research, we said no other $5 trillion economic sector would be happy with so little investment in research related to its core agenda. So if we don't value knowledge in primary health care, in universal health coverage, in financing, in the workforce, then what is the incentive for academic health centers to develop scholarship and uh, opportunities for really um, uh, strengthening the knowledge agenda? And I would argue, not great, and we need to keep an eye on research policy in this regard. I'm going to switch now to know-how for UHC. Another World Health Report I was involved in looked at um, how we're doing it with respect to health workers globally. And this was in the context of, do we have enough health workers to achieve the MDGs in health, the 2015 objectives? And we identified a critical shortage of health workers in 57 countries and a small number, 4.3 million short, just to achieve basic coverage, okay? Massive shortfall. 
Uh, updating of those models of, the sh of, of shortfalls has been done using uh, a need, uh, a demand, a market demand approach. And when you compare those and look at them across income groups, low income, low middle income, upper middle income, you can see that for the SDGs, the 2030 objectives, um, the numbers needed um, are in the 10 million range and differing across countries, much more in low income. But if you look at what will happen based on estimated labor market demand, you see that there's going to be a huge growth in demand for health workers, particularly in upper middle income countries. Okay, so labor markets have a big impact here. And as you see, the distribution across regions and burden of disease here on the, on the y-axis and wealth is the size of the, bu uh, of the budgets, uh, of the bubbles. Um, you see Americas and, and Europe um, with the massive uh, majority share of the global workforce, uh, the lowest burden of disease, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, um, with the highest burdens of disease and the lowest portions of the global of the workforce. So this is a real market failure when it comes to where health workers are needed most. However, it could get a lot worse. We have a global decline in fertility, not only in OECD countries, but in virtually all countries of the world, save the African continent, okay? And Africa, in and of itself, is going through a very, very rapid transition. Uh, again, this slide uh, from Susna Day shows how The Economist, um, my continuing education journal, um, uh, views Africa in 2000 as the hopeless continent, uh, in 2010, Africa rising, in 2013, it's aspiring, and in 2035, it's taking off. It's expected to have a GDP greater than $14 trillion. And by 2100, one in every two people living on the planet will be from Africa. So as rich countries lose productive age workers, and have greater needs for healthcare related to aging, and the demand for health workers grow, where do you think health workers are going to be in greatest abundance? Huge pressure on international migration of health workers. And this interdependence, again, is something where we need to have a much better understanding and scholarship. If we look at how well academic health centers are doing in the training of health professionals, um, it's a crisis, and this is a personalized slide. It's an alliterative crisis. Uh, you have students skews and suffering. You have prehistoric pedagogy, faculty fleeing, institutional inadequacies, investment insufficiency and inefficiency, and absent accreditation. All right? So this is obviously a polarized view of the crisis in quality of education and access but it reflects the malaise that many academic health centers find themselves in in many, many contexts. You have huge urban bias in the location of health professional education institutions. Here in Bangladesh, you can see Dhaka, the capital city, has the large majority of health professional education institutions. If you look at the trend in public and private mix, the private sector is growing um, much, much more rapidly than public sector or publicly financed uh, uh, education institutions. And that trend is not only in Bangladesh, but also India and Brazil. So the whole landscape of health professional education institutions is changing. So um, as this uh, uh, fellow used to say, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, and so um, in 2010, I had the opportunity to be on the commission um, called Health Professionals for a New Century, uh, and uh, led by Julio Frank and Lincoln Chen. And that came up with a bunch of prescriptions 
on the 100th anniversary of the Flexner Report to transform education, to strengthen health systems in an interdependent world. And so this really started saying, OK, can we tackle systematically and move to better performance of health professional systems? Part of the analysis was that if you're going to fix the supply in terms of health workers' education, you need to do that in a full understanding of the demand coming from the health system. So in the absence of UHC, a policy whereby you're getting universal access without financial harm for everyone, uh, you have the current situation on the demand side, which is jobs are all in urban and hospital settings, focusing on acute care to treat ill patients. Pa payment is based on volume, not quality. And access to care is based on a patient's ability to pay. That results in neglecting the poor, rural, and remote populations, and failing to make preventive promotive interventions, um, and leading to chronic low performance of the health system. And the link then to the supply is that you have a weak pool of eligible students. Um, you have inadequate scale and narrow, narrow scope of education institution, curriculum or curricula that focus on marketable skills only, and accreditation and licensing that functions primarily as a barrier to entry from which monopoly rents can be exacted and not with a function of promoting quality. This leads to labor shortages, underemployment, unemployment, overspecialization, rising costs of education, low quality of training, and low performance. Again, putting it in stark terms. Guided by UHG, you can change this in such a way that you get the balance across primary and curative. You get jobs located closer to population needs, payments based on outcomes, and you can get the diversity, the scale and scope of educational institutions, the career opportunities, competency-based curricula, such that you get a workforce that is adequate in number, appropriate in skill mix, evenly distributed, and performing well. So that's where we want to head. But boy, have we got a long way to go. One other area that was identified as really important in the context of the commission and very important for me as I think about uh, my new job is to think about the three types of learning that are critical for all health workers. One is the informative. Those are the specific skills that give you the opportunity to know something, to be an expert. The second is formative, and those are the values that allow you to direct that knowledge in the way that it needs to be directed so that it achieves objectives. Equity, dignity, those are real competencies. And finally, transformative competencies, and that is the recognition that every health worker is a leader and a change agent, and you need to have competencies to understand how to make change. We're not simply people who stand on, a conveyor, uh, on a, an assembly line and put widgets on, onto a moving belt, right? We think, we reflect, we see problems, and we advance change. So. With that, let me just finish by identifying leaders, people who I think are helping and have made great strides and provide me with some inspiration. First, Fitzhugh Mullen. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, he was one of the sole and lone voices with respect to focusing on the health workforce as a matter of primary academic concern. And he created the Institute at George Washington University, the first of its kind, which was looking at the health workforce. Um, and uh, I think is the sort of academic leadership uh, that we need much more of. Somebody who had nothing to do with health, Sir Fazal Abed, unfortunately he passed away in 2019. Uh, but as the pioneer of the lar world's largest NGO, uh, he was 
absolutely committed to scale. He wanted to see systems-wide change. Pilots, those are for the airlines. He was interested in seeing uh, change in Bangladesh, which meant that every 100, 160 million people um, uh, would benefit. I had the opportunity to work under him, and he and I and others recognized that Bangladesh needs more midwives. And so I had this surreal opportunity where I walked into his office one day and I said, well, you know, why don't we build a hub and spoke model? We'll have a little group in urban Bangladesh where we'll develop the faculty and the curriculum, and then we'll satellite it out to hubs, which are going to be in the communities of greatest need so you can train midwives where they're living. And that way they won't have to worry about coming to Dhaka, the urban area, that way they'll be trained and working in their communities. So he says, oh, sounds like a good idea. I said, okay, well, so what do you want me to do? Do you want me to concept, no paper, strategy? He said, no, start. And so we started. And that program is going very well at the moment. Um, the James P. Grant School of Public Health, where I was the dean, um, sometimes people said I was uh, Tim Evans at the James Dean School of Public Health. Uh, but um, uh, this was our curriculum, um, uh, community-based, problem-focused, um, and uh, classrooms uh, really without walls. Um, they say success uh, spawns a thousand parents or uh, fathers, um, but uh, we found this in 2012 on the Harvard School of Public Health website. And this was advertising their MPH program. And it just so happens this picture is a, of a student uh, in the back uh, who is a James P. Grant School of Public Health System, uh, a student, and this was actually fully um, taken from our school at the time. Um, so I had the distinct privilege of writing a letter to the de then dean of the School of Public Health to inform him of uh, this oversight. And, uh, uh, Julio, who it was at the time, Julio Frank, he, he, he was very gracious in acknowledging it. Uh, but the lawyers are still working on the settlement. Uh, so. uh, I couldn't come to Duke without measure, uh, uh, mentioning Paul. Paul and I were uh, uh, conspirators in the cardiac uh, intensive care unit at the Brigham one weekend a few years ago. Uh, but Paul um, uh, has uh, done so much to realize the right to health for every individual everywhere, number one. But number two, as an academic leader and under Victor Zhao's leadership, they created um, the Department of Global Health Equity, which I think may be the first in any academic health institution. And second, uh, a very intrepid program on global health delivery. And I think that sort of leadership has been massively influential in helping us rethink and make a union between the clinical world that has so much to contribute to global health and universal health coverage and the policy or public health worlds. Um, Agnes Binaguajo, she is the first vice chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity. University of Global Health Equity is started by partners in health and NGO, um, and they're saying we need leadership uh, to focus on the most vulnerable with a big focus on implementation science. They're basing their schools in rural areas. I had the opportunity to visit Butero in Rwanda where they have their first school, and they're walking the talk on changing not only the instruction but the institutional dynamics of health professional education, not only in Rwanda, but they have plans to do that in seven sites. And I'm delighted to say that Agnes Binaguajo has accepted uh, the Victor uh, and Ruth Cooper Zhao um, uh, 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 lectureship at McGill uh, in May. So finally, uh, a big thanks to Victor and Ruth. I'm sorry I'm not to, to see her, but uh, these two, I think, through these lectures uh, and much more importantly through their leadership on a day-to-day -day basis have been um, really uh, providing unprecedented opportunities for academic health centers to step up. So I hope we can honor their leadership and their legacy. Thank you very much.
Uh, we've got a little time for questions and Tim can stick around and I think we've got a microphone in the back and so if you would kindly just identify yourself and uh, uh, pose your questions to uh, Tim. Raise your hands please. That would be super. Oops. Lock and load. One up in the front here. Tim, that was an inspiring lecture, and I think you've outlined all those elements that's needed to uh, achieve UXC, and also the potential role of universities in being leaders. So I want to ask you a question about what do we need to do as universities in the areas that you have identified, which is education, innovation, right? Also, if you talk about uh, financial innovation, FinTech, University of Business Schools and others, as well as technology, as you pointed out. So can you kind of put together what we need to do as a university to bring these pieces together to actually address UXC? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I'll, give it, I'll give it a try. That's a, um, a formidable challenge, Victor, uh, but a great question. And one that, uh, quite frankly, I'm, I'm tussling with on a day-by-day -day basis because I hope that I can make some incremental contribution on that front. But a couple things that I think are going to be important. First, I think the global health lens is incredibly inviting uh, to mobilizing the delta force of academic health centers. Um, and so I'm very much one who's promoting UHC and, and under the global health umbrella as something that is relevant to everybody in the university. And I say that because I, the worst scenario for me is that global health is seen as poor care for poor people in poor countries. That is really not going to generate the energy and the, um, the innovation uh, and the um, changes in behavior that we need to think. So how to do that? First, um, if you look demographically at what's happening in the world, um, every country, virtually every country, is becoming much, much more diverse. And so uh, one of the things that I'm pushing is that we should create a culture in research and the data sciences associated with um, uh, global health that we're sampling from 7 billion. That's the objective, right? That's where the power is rather than in Canada, sampling from 35 million, right? And why do we say that? Because when you look at the 35 million people in Canada and you look at their backgrounds, we have 150 different diasporas that constitute that 35 million. So if we can make links to all those other countries where they come from or where they came from or where they have genetic heritage or sociocultural or linguistic heritage, then understanding how to develop opportunities to improve their health is going to grow. So one is to get that sense that the global frontier of knowledge is one that's accessible and is going to make a huge difference with respect to opportunities locally in addition to globally. A second is, I think, um, uh, tapping into demand from students. Uh, they see the future. <laughs> um, you may appreciate this, Victor. When, when Jim and I were at the bank, uh, we had the Brigham Internal Medicine Pediatric residents down for lunch. And they're all sitting around a table having a nice lunch. And we said, OK, well, tell us what you do. And uh, you know, there are 25 of them. And uh, it, the story was, yes, well, I'm doing this. I'm double board certifying in this. And in my spare time, I'm developing a startup. And next person, yeah, and I'm doing a startup too. Well, I've got two startups, and I just sold my startup, right? And, and you realize that the entrepreneurial drive in these folks was so generationally different than it was in my day, which was the previous century, um, whereby the big deal was that you were doing an MPH or an, a PhD in addition to clinical training, right? So I think if you look at that, coupled with one young, the next generation uh, don't see global borders the same way we do. Two, they're agnostic to disciplines. 
right? If it's useful and can help solve a problem, they want to know about it, all right? So if you take those things, and I think you can be creative on educational opportunity in two areas that I think are really important. Um, first is with respect to cultivating more problem-solving competencies as an explicit focus and uh, doing that around entrepreneurialism or you know, pragmatic policy and creating problems that give people an opportunity to develop those skills which take them beyond the confines of pure clinical training or uh, the, up until this time, uh, are uh, the other route into a slightly bigger picture was clinical epi. And so I think uh, really giving global health delivery uh, and the policy sciences and the entrepreneurial sciences more focus uh, in uh, health professional training is going to help um, crowdsource and see people move in uh, to this area uh, rather than leave it isolated as something that's uh, too complex and doesn't really concern them. Last thing I'd say is that um, comparative health systems research uh, has tremendous value. And um, uh, if we have good programs of comparative health systems research, then those lessons that can be shared across borders related to problems that are the same fundamentally but have to have a tailored solution locally, uh, I think uh, has a lot of value. So those are just a few random thoughts on your tough question. <laughs> Hello, and well done for this very fantastic presentation. I work with the National Health Insurance Scheme in Nigeria, and my concern is the rising cost of healthcare. You know, I, as a policy maker, I am battled with the uh, concern of trying to prioritize, you know, which intervention to provide to my people, which one not to provide, even though I know they are equally important, but resources are limited in my hands, so I have to, so what role do you think universities can play in guiding you know, lower middle income countries like Nigeria or even advanced countries like the US in the context of designing innovative programs to you know, utilize available resources in order to maximize impact and uh, provide comprehensive care to the populace? It's yeah, a great question. So just two quick responses. Um, one, um, uh, Universities, I think, have a huge uh, um, role in understanding the demand side uh, of the healthcare system, meaning the demand from the population and the patients. Uh, and so uh, developing active programs to uh, interface with the public, uh, to educate them about uh, good quality care, uh, and, and work with those rising expectations because expectations for care are rising everywhere, uh, I think is important. And there's not a lot of work on that front. Uh, we're seeing that um, the anti-vax movement, for example, is, is global and gaining strength and having huge implications in terms of uh, you know, a spike in measles deaths last year when we thought we were much closer to elimination. So. It, Understanding, interfacing actively with the public and doing that in a way where it's disciplined through the university. Second, on the su supply side of financing. If you continue to have a system where most of the money is paid out of pocket when you go and see the provider, you have no opportunity to pool and strategically purchase. So you've got to put a priority on figuring out how to get that money into prepayment or into pools, because once it's into pools, then you've got leverage over what interventions you're going to reimburse and what providers are going to be accredited. Without that, it's really, really tough. So I would say put all the innovation energy, um, working with the telemobility crowd and others, fintech, and think about how to harness those out-of-pocket payments massively uh, fertile area for academic leadership. Yeah. 
anyway, I want to connect a couple of the dots um, and uh, ask you about digital technologies for health. Uh, you talked about all of those amazing students that all have the startup on the side that they're interested in. Uh, you spoke very comprehensively about uh, health professional training and the role of the university in enhancing and increasing the core of health professionals. I work in non-communicable diseases where there's a huge need for more trained health professionals that can work on you know, the whole pathway of care from screening to case management and palliative care and so on. You're familiar with all of that. Um, there's been a lot of talk about digital technologies for health. There are uh, companies, start, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens, I can't even say how many companies starting up and failing all the time that are offering digital technologies for health. Where can the university fit in? Um, aside from generating those new entrepreneurs. And I'll say what I'm interested in particularly is the role of university as a, a protector of social, social values, social interests, and um, the fact that these technologies are getting put out there on the market with, in my view, very little protection for people's privacy and data and so on. So that's a concern of mine that Clearly, universities could play a role, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. I want to hear what, what you think well, can be done here. For, Thank it's you. It's great to see you, Rachel, first. And, and second, a great question. I, I think there's a huge opportunity. Uh, actually, Victor and I have been discussing this on, on emerging technologies front, but I'm, I'm actually co-chairing a task force on AI for Health at the moment. And part of the reason we're looking at that is, uh, is that, and this is in the Canadian context, um, is that in order to um, you know, um, harness the opportunity fully, you do need stewardship. Um, and there's stewardship and science and the development of the science. So stewardship is, is around the values. Um, uh, are the data sets representative? Um, uh, are they being um, managed in such a way that privacy and, and protection is, is, is fundamental? Um, uh, uh, ownership of data issues, a uh, whole set of ethical issues. And, and I'd like to say that um, the whole area of science ethics related to health is a big, huge growth industry, uh, especially if you look at our current supply. Um, barriers to access to technology have gone down so much that um, uh, you know, people can do anything in the innovation space. Uh, we have a, a, a critical shortage of ethical guidance across not only um, not only the uh, AI or digital area, but in many many areas. However, um, uh, so one is to to get that uh, uh, straightened. Two is to look at the uh, the development of the science. Um, what constitutes a good algorithm that's ready for prime time? And we just don't have those decision criteria that have been agreed. Um, once we get those agreed. And academe could be very helpful in working with things like FDA and others to, to develop those criteria. Um, so yes, that's, that's where the science we have at, at McGill, we have a great AI community, fantastic. But what we're finding now is our computational scientists, the computer engineers who are the algorithm nerds, they're coming over to our biostats group at, to learn about causal inference, right? which I think is wonderful. That's the way a university should work. But it's just that we need to build those bridges to mature the science in an accelerator and be critical, critical about evaluating what performance of these new technologies. That's absolutely in our domain um, as in academic health centers. Thanks. We have two more questions. I'm going to take Nimi here at the back and then John O'Yu at the front. But those are the last two questions we have time for. Um, hi, Dr. Evans. My name is Nimi Ramanujam, and I really appreciated your very stimulating talk. Um, I'm being a biomedical engineer. I have a very, I have a technology-oriented talk. I mean, a question. Um, so, if I if I think about it in a very simple way, um, for universal healthcare to be efficient, you you need the the, the health system um, and the people need to sort of the people who need care need to sort of work well together. There needs to be demand from the patients or the, or the individuals to seek care. Care has to be accessible, and the quality of care has to be effective in order to have an impact. And as a technologist, I think about the potential 
for uh, technologies that can essentially be exported from hospitals and brought to community settings that can essentially uh, provide the same quality of performance. And for example, AI to be able to uh, essentially um, aid a non-expert to become an expert over time. So all of this is possible with technology, but what I'm noticing in my own work is that there is a, I don't wanna say the word reluctance, but there is a challenge in, um, being able to task shift. In other words, professional societies or experts may not be willing to say, well, I've done all this hard work and you know, to have someone do that essentially um, in lieu of them because for one, it's a source of revenue and um, there might be other reasons as well. So I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts about that. Yeah, so it's a great, great point. And um, uh, next time I give my talk, I'm just going to use your paraphrase of it because it's much more efficient and clear. Uh, but um, the, <clears throat> um, there are vested interests everywhere in the system. I, I mentioned uh, the 1962 uh, Saskatchewan Medicare Act and, and the Saskatchewan Medicare uh, Medical Association saying, we're out of here. And we're not coming back until this, this piece of legislation is repealed. All right, so um, I think um, that's not a totally under, uh, miss, uh, it's not a reaction that's unusual. Um, and, and of course, professions stand up for themselves and, and things. I don't think there's an easy solution. Um, what I think is important um, is to uh, is two things. Um, one is to cultivate a much greater sense of dynamic in the development of professions so that they're not fixed in time forever. They evolve, right? And if the professional ethos was one of evolution, then it might feel that there are ways in which the profession is moving uh, that would allow and accommodate a re-delegation of, of responsibilities because technology makes it, facilitates it, there's more effective supervision, whatever the facilitators are that people can gain confidence in. Uh, but one has to be sensitive to uh, the needs of various uh, professional groups. The second is I think we have um, uh, need to change the sense of what the career structure looks like for health professionals. And rather than being a single type of professional for 50 years, right, there should be much more opportunity to think about redirecting careers at, say, a 15 or 20 year threshold. And so that you can build on your experience and move in a different direction um, and therefore feel like you don't have to hold on to that one area you were trained in uh, because there tons of opportunities and jobs in the health sector. Unfortunately, we are one of the most inefficient sectors from an economic perspective and will be for the foreseeable future, no matter what happens on the digital front, which means that we're a massively job-intensive sector. So it isn't an issue that we don't have enough jobs in the health sector for people who want to work there. It's just that they may change over time, and I think we need to, academic health centers need to be much more sensitive to the career paths and opportunities for people to significantly redirect their careers after 15, 20, 25 years, uh, drawing on that experience, but then moving in a direction where they may in fact be much more effective agents of doing things uh, that would benefit the system and allow them then not to feel like they guard that that, that the guild, uh, or else it's, there's, there's nothing else. Uh, hi, John Oquick, DGHR, hey Tim. Uh, so that was a great journey through, through uh, the, the evolution and dynamics and uh, future needs of UHC as only someone who's been as many places as you, you've been could, could do. I have a question about the numbers that we saw about health workers and finance and needs and all. And basically, it does it assume that we're going to continue to um, create as much disease as, as we're creating with our behaviors and our environment and everything else, and particularly as we see the shift to, to uh, I mean, shift, it's the, the preponderance of, of chronic diseases. 
Um, and so what's the relation between thinking around UHC and the sort of attacking the social, commercial, uh, uh, behavioral factors that create all our demand, because it's, it's really exciting to, vent, to de develop new medicines and new technologies, um, but we're never going to be able to afford everything if we keep make, making ourselves uh, sicker than, than we could be. So um, I don't have a quick answer to that. It's a really, um, I think what you're painting is the reality that we're going to have uh, increasing issues of scarcity and choice, no matter what, in part because we have technologies um, and opportunities which are going to create um, uh, uh, new, um, new sorts of issues in health, right? So if you look at in the area of genomics and polygenic variants and uh, those sorts of things, you can now risk stratify people with diabetes in ways that you couldn't before and you're going to need different types of treatment, et cetera. That may end up creating, um, um, you know, prospectively a uh, much more intense relationship with uh, diabetic patients over time. I'm just using that as one example. Um, and so uh, I think uh, on one hand, um, that may not be a bad thing, right? There's nothing wrong with more jobs in the health sector. It's actually employs mostly women and, and they're good jobs. So uh, we shouldn't be a, a negative. On the other hand, uh, having good criteria for identifying um, how to use limited resources is gonna be particularly important. Uh, how to identify places where you're getting poor value, right? So this whole shift to purchasing for value instead of volume, I, I think is going to transform a lot of issues um, where we're getting not so good value uh, for money at the moment. Um, and then I go back to saying, um, again, uh, larger pools, uh, strategic purchasing give you leverage over providers and purchasers. And uh, you, you, if you don't have those, if your system is hopelessly fragmented, a little bit like this one is, um, then uh, the opportunities to manage healthcare inflation are, are, are much more limited. Um, it's actually more jobs for people who want to try and figure out how to solve the problem. Good for academic health centers, but um, it's, um, those are just a few thoughts on, 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 on the fact that I think we'll all have jobs well into the future because the likelihood of us solving all the issues related to UHC in the next uh, 10 years are, is very low, so um, we'll, uh, we'll be able to continue. Good. Thank you. Uh, Chris, Thanks you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to Tim for a great lecture. Thanks to Victor and Ruth. Uh, thanks to the communications and development teams for organizing the event. And thanks to the audience for great questions, great discussion. Yeah.